Pan. Um, we are extremely excited to be here at FOSDEM and speak about the topic that we are truly passionate about, which is observability, Prometheus, and a bit of going. Um, and we hope this talk is really actionable for you and insightful. Um, this is because at the end of this talk, I would like you to know uh, three things. First of all, why instrumenting application uh, with metrics is really, really essential. Secondly, how to do it quickly with uh, make sure that you have metrics for Prometheus to use. And last but not the least, um, what are the common mistakes that you should avoid? And the mistakes that we've seen during our work with uh, Prometheus metrics uh, going in uh, amazing but sometimes wild open source world. So before that short introduction, my name is uh, Bartek Plotka. I am an engineer working at Red Hat team, uh, monitoring OpenShift team. And I love open source, I love solving problems, usually using Go. And I'm part of the Prometheus team, and I also co-author uh, co of the Thanos project, which essentially um, is a durable system scaling uh, that scales Prometheus. And with me, there is uh, Kemal. Hello, everyone. My, my name is Kemal. I also work for OpenShift monitoring team. I love working with Prometheus, Go, and Kubernetes as well, and I'm also a contributor to Thanos. Um, so let's have fun. Let's uh, try, well, we'll talk about today about building a load balancer in Go, kind of. For demo purposes, let's imagine that uh, we want to implement application level uh, HTTP load balancer, and let's say we'll do it in Go, uh, because why not? But essentially programming language here doesn't matter. We just cho choose Go because most of infrastructure stuff we are doing are in this language. So let's say we implemented uh, yeah, transpar uh, transparent load balancer like this. Um, from high level view, we have a couple of components um, in Go. So first of all, we have like single HTTP server that implements serve HTTP method. Um, so handler via mm, a really nice reverse proxy um, structure in, available in HTTP util uh, standard library in Go. And then uh, this reverse proxy allows us to inject a an custom, um, custom uh, transport, which is like run tripper. And so we implement our own tra transport called LB transport which um, essentially uh, have few components. First of all, it has discover, which, is, uh, which gives us a target to proxy to, and then based on those targets, um, uh, round robin picker picks uh, the one in round robin fair manner. So, you know, first replica one, then replica two, three, one, two, three. <laughs> Um, so, um, and then the load balancer uh, forwards the request to the given replica and proxy the response back to the, to the user. Um, so this looks great. This looks like, well, this implementation should work. Why not? Um, so let's say we deploy this, uh, you know, couple of replicas of this behind some uh, microservices in front of some microservices and uh, we let it run for longer time. And, you know, as soon as, uh, it, it, it runs, I will hit the LB endpoint, try it out, it works, so, well, we are done, right? Like, it works. Well, maybe not necessarily. Like, it works for me, but does it work for other users? Like, what about if I'm not checking, does it work at that time as well? Like, do we have an information about, like, how many errors it, um, um, how many request error uh, like failed essentially with like 502 status code, which means like the load balancer could not proxy the request. Like we don't really have this information, right? And what about other questions like is front robin picker actually working? Is it actually picking in a fair manner? Is this is uh, the replica number two actually having one fair of the requests? And what was the distribution like yesterday? Like how to tell that? Um, and you know other questions like what about latency like the load balancer is like endpoint is very slow and like is it my target being slow or maybe load balancer introduced some latency to the request right and finally you know maybe you are having uh, some incident and you want to look what was the version yesterday that was running at 2 p.m. and uh, yeah what was rolled back then and this insight like is missing in our implementation, right? So what's missing is essentially a monitoring. So we can have lots of those questions and we need to know, or it would be nice to have answers for those even though we don't know the questions even beforehand, right? That's why in Site Reliability uh, Engineering book uh, made, uh, written by, by Google guys, you will find that monitoring is the foundation of, the, um, of, of, of having a production system and running production system before implementing the system itself. And uh, you know, as you might be familiar, 
some monitoring signals are, you know, metrics, logs, tracing. Um, but, you know, guess which signal will help us in this case and, like, will give us the quickest answer to those questions. And, yeah, the answer is metrics. Um, metrics most likely give us the answer. The answer that, in comparison to logs and traces and maybe profiling, is uh, cheaper, um, near real time, and definitely actionable. So we can alert and act. Either humans can act on it or maybe uh, computers as well. And in practice, metrics probably should be your first um, item on the monitoring to-do list. And uh, as Bjorn mentioned uh, on the talk before, before us, um, instrument first, ask questions later. So that's, uh, and you know, why Prometheus, secondly? Well, I might be biased, but Prometheus for me is the simplest and the cheapest option for um, collecting, storing, and querying metrics right now. It fits both, um, it's part of CNCF and also fits um, simple applications, like small applications, but also bigger, one, bigger ones with help of other projects like Cortex, Thanos, and FreeDB um, in the CNCF space. So, well, let's try to instrument our load balancer with metrics. And, well, like, let's try to answer this exact question. Like, how many, what's the error rate of uh, our requests um, that users are seeing? To do so, we could introduce a counter, right? Um, and we can, inc we can we essentially have this information by incrementing this counter every time we hit, uh, we have a request in our server, and we can um, report the method that was used and the response status code that was returned by the, uh, by the server. So let's try to introduce this metric in Golang. And we start that by, I hope like you are familiar with that, but we'll go through this um, pretty quickly. So first of all, like we are talking again about Golang. However, um, there are like 18 other uh, language, uh, programming languages supported by you know, other libraries in, the, in, in, uh, in, the, in that languages. And, um, but here we need to first import um, the official client Golang library um, and to add the metric we are we need to define um, a variable we have to choose some names some uh, descriptions help and labels and um, uh, labels are our dimension for the metric right so each unique value in on any of those labels will result in totally new series and that's really important um, information as well Next step is to actually use this variable, use this counter, right? So we have like a serve HTTP wrapper that will um, um, do the request and then record the status and uh, increment our counter using add one uh, or there's even inc um, method that uh, adds uh, uh, one more um, to the value. And something that is really easy to forget is that the fact that we need to register the metric. And we do that via package level must register uh, function. Then, thanks to that, we, ha we can add another endpoint to our server, uh, slash metrics, which is like the convention. And this endpoint give, uh, returns a metric exposition format, um, text metric exposition format like this. So it gives us the metrics that we registered uh, via this regist register. Um, so, once we add that to our loan balancer, we can connect Prometheus. So it's like a single binary that you run in the same cluster and point to the load balancer um, slash metric endpoint and it will periodically collect those metrics, let's say every 15 seconds. And this way you can then go to the UI after some time, the Prometheus UI or Grafana, and actually use those metrics. So here we can see um, the um, number of requests per minute um, by code and method. And you can see that we have like 120 total. Some of them are errors, most of them are successes. So this is great, like our load balancer has some insights, uh, allow us to uh, debug stuff and, and know uh, what is happening inside. So this looks easy, right? We, with few steps, few lines of code, and we have metrics. So everything is perfect. Well, not really. There are some edge cases, right? Um, it looked easy, but in the, you know, in most cases, well, in some cases, um, during our work, we've seen that uh, it can cause some problems. So, um, and this is what we learned during, you know, reviewing and developing and uh, instrumentation code that is meant to be run on production. 
uh, in closed but mainly on open source. So we'll go with Camel with few less and more advanced issues and how to resolve them. First one, pitfall number one, global registry. So there is a saying uh, in very good uh, Peter Borgon blog post, a theory of modern go, a global, st a global magic is bad, a global state is magic. And that's certainly true um, in, in all of those cases, especially if you use Prometheus client to instrument um, your application with metrics and application, I mean, let's say you instrument a library, right? And you can imagine that this library will be used by your project, but also for other users in open source. And, um, and this can cause problems and you will see why in a second. And especially this is important because somehow in Prometheus ecosystem, like this pattern of using global registry leaked as a good pattern, it is not. And we are really, uh, really trying to make, don't laugh, <laughs> it's really wrong. And uh, I know, I know, but like uh, it's essentially, uh, we want to make sure it's obsolete and we'll show you better way and essentially what are the consequences if you are using a global registry, right? So um, let's take our example again. And as you might see, there are two global states here. First of all, we have a global variable. Secondly, we have a global registry. Um, so mass register hides underneath the default register struct uh, that holds the global state per package. Now, what's the issue? What's the problem, right? So first of all, um, it's a magic. So it means that if another package just, uh, you just imported or dependency of the packages you imported, um, registered a metric with exactly the same name that you want to register right now, it will explode, like everything will panic. And the problem is it will panic with the stack trace on the, of the second registration and you have no idea what was the first registration at all. Like you need to dig through code, like, um, I don't know, like reg apps or whatever, or just change your metric name. Like it's, it's magic. And like I had this problem so many times, even on standard Go libraries, when you uh, kind of register like uh, Go like memory kind of uh, metrics as well. Like this is a very common thing. This is why you should not use global registry. The second problem is lack of flexibility. So let's imagine we have not one endpoint, but three. One, two, three. And we just increment metric on each of those. Now you can see we don't have really much of the information here. Like, let's say if I want to know the, what's the error rate of, um, of endpoint of the, met, of the request against endpoint number three. We don't know because everything is grouped together. Now let's say I want to actually have that information, right? What should I, what should I do in this case? Um, well, remove the global state, right? So, so let's fix this problem. First of all, instead of our variable, um, global variable, we create a struct that um, wraps the, the variable and you can instantiate finally those variables as you want. So fi finally, you can have many of those metrics. However, if you start to use this way, in, in this way, and, um, and use our new metric, Sorry, um, it's still registered in a global state. So let's remove that default registry with custom registered that you can instantiate again and you uh, can inject inside our new server metrics. And in this way, each, you are in the control of your registry because I just created that, I added some metrics, I can add more metrics like default Golang one as well and I'm in the control, I know explicitly what I added to that. So I, I can test it, I can uh, do whatever, and it's super powerful. So let's see if we can achieve our goal with flexibility as well. This will panic, obviously, because we just used those, uh, we tried to register three times metric with exactly the same name, uh, so that's a problem. However, we can resolve that very, very easily with something called wrap with labels method. Oh, function, sorry, which allows you to inject a certain um, static labels or prefix to the metrics. And that's exactly what we need here, right? Because we, uh, we want to group our metrics per, per handler. So suddenly, thanks to that, we have, um, yeah, we, can, we know what's the error rate of the endpoint number three. So this is the pattern I would suggest instead, instead of doing uh, default registry. And this is what we already do, for example, in Thanos project for every package we use. Um, it's somehow more code, but trust me, like it's worth it. Pitfall number two, no tests. And this is something I'm really passionate about because metrics and other observability signals like tracing and logs are never tested. Like 
like literally who tests the log line if it's um, actually logged in a proper moment with the proper message. Like no one do that because usually log lines are um, are for hu kind of um, for humans, right? They they just need to read, so maybe exact message doesn't matter. However, I would argue that for metrics, well it's really important to test it. Like the reliability of the metric and you depend on the metric so much that you should actually test it. And I will tell you, I mean, let's see why we should do that first of all. So let's take our uh, example of our load balancer with our metric and we are solid 10x developers obviously so we want to test our, um, our load balancer properly so we created a unit test. So what we did was essentially we have LB transport run tripper, we mocked different things like discover and run throbir, we mocked our targets to be unavailable just for simple test case uh, and we mocked response as well and, uh, and a request to test if uh, and how the test looks like, essentially we send free requests and because nothing is available, we should expect have, uh, we should uh, assert on free responses being from the 502. Um, really easy, this test passed. It looks in the code like this, you have a unit test, you start a load balancer and then you send free requests and you, by using HTTP tests, very useful package, um, uh, standard package as well, you <coughs> record the response of this and assure that it's 502 three times. Easy. So now we are kind of safe, right? Like uh, everything, we tested everything, like we can do different ca test cases as well, but we are fine, right? Well, not really because imagine we made a bug in instrumenting the metric and suddenly we forgot to instrument properly the code and we always put 200. Um, so what happened? Well, you send free requests, you assert on free responses 502, but suddenly if you deploy that on production, if you have some errors, the um, metric page would show you like success, everything is fine. And like it's super easy to make those bugs, like it's a code like, an others, uh, like any other, so um, this is pretty serious. And why is serious? Like someone can say, okay, this is like analytic thing, like it's a small bug, maybe mislead some people, but who cares? Well, not, because like, look at this. Like this is the alert that is very, very popular nowadays. Uh, like essentially it's it alerts on symptoms of the user not being able to use your service, right? So, um, and it actually um, relies on the metric. And suddenly if you have like all successes uh, uh, reported by this, by this metric, even though there were lots of errors, this alert will not fire. And you rely on this, this, fire, uh, this alert to be fired, you know, during night, for example, during incidents. So it's really bad if you, um, if you don't test your metric. So what we want to do is to extend this test a little bit. And first of all, because there are no, no traffic, no request, we assert on zero cardinality. So there, is, there should be no series um, given by this metric. After the traffic, after our free requests, we should still um, assert on kind of correctness of our application, but then assert also about cardinality that, hey, we should have one metric. And uh, we also should um, assert that this one metric should have a value free for 502 code. And let's see how we can do that in the Go. Again, we have nice uh, server metrics uh, structure. We have our unit test. We um, use a really handy Prometheus test util package. And then if uh, before any, we do anything, we assert that this metric is not incremented, there is no metric return, kind of, there is no cardinality. And we do that with the call it and count <coughs> function. Then we uh, do the request, assert the correctness, and then check if there is one cardinality at the end. And then uh, we check the value of free using uh, two float 64, very explicit name, um, and uh, and check if the value is free. Now, what is um, powerful here is that when I, re I will run this test and I have the bug I mentioned, it will fail. Like this is exactly what we wanted to achieve, right? So um, this is really powerful. Like with few lines of code, you can add on top of our existing unit tests. Um, you know, um, some tests against your observability and I really encourage you to do so and we do that in the Thanos code if you want to look on examples. So now I will let Kemal to talk about other pitfalls. Yes, all right. Uh, yeah, one of the other pitfall, pitfall number three is about lack of consistency. Uh, there are some higher level uh, methods that we can use with the metrics uh, to observe our 
applications, uh, which uh, one of like the four golden signals from the uh, Google SRE book, uh, use method and red method, which is uh, by Tom Wilkie. He sits over there. Uh, and uh, let's, for that, take red method. Uh, so these methods kind of help us uh, because like with the, with the help of these methods, uh, we define uh, some predefined signals. Uh, so that we can potentially debug and uh, alert uh, on, on our application. Also, uh, with the help of these common methods, we can build some, uh, we can reuse uh, pre-built alerts and rules and dashboards as well. Uh, so for the red method, uh, R stands for request per second, uh, E for errors, and uh, D for duration. So for our demo application, uh, let's again define an HTTP request total method. And in this method, we can actually aggregate and track uh, requests. So for requests, we already have code and method labels, uh, so we can track them by code and method. For the errors, we can actually write some queries on uh, status code, uh, but we don't have a uh, duration uh, just by using a counter. So we need to introduce a histogram for that. So by introducing a histogram, we can track the duration so that we can calculate our latencies. Uh, so, which like by just having, uh, by just like conforming a couple of conventions, uh, we will end up using uh, really cool libraries like monitoring, mixing, <coughs> and whatnot. So, uh, of course, another pitfall is about naming, and it's of course one of the common pitfalls because uh, you know. Naming is one of the hardest uh, problems in computer science. But it's supposed to be easy for Prometheus because we have an official documentation. So it's really, uh, uh, really good written, and you just need to use it. And yeah, it's helpful, just do it. Uh, to like demonstrate or emphasize a couple of points from that documentation, uh, like uh, you need to uh, suffix your methods uh, with base units. Uh, the base unit form is important so that you can transform uh, your units between uh, other units uh, practically. Uh, for accumulating counters, uh, you need to use total as a uh, suffix. This actually will be uh, mandatory with open metrics. So maybe it's a good time to just try to uh, convert your metrics. Uh, and uh, please use uh, info suffix for your meta information metrics. All right, uh, again, uh, about naming, there's another aspect of it, it's stability. So if you uh, use a, met let, let's see an example for that again. Again, same example, HTTP request total. And uh, if you uh, define this, and for whatever reason, a reason at certain, oh, sorry. Uh, and you decide to use that in, a, in an alert, and for whatever reason, at some at certain point, you decide to change the name and put a protocol in it. Now you actually break your alert, and this won't fire, but it's, it also won't fail. So you can uh, create these implicit errors for your system. So just be consistent and be careful with your names. All right, pitfall number five, uh, cardinality. So. When we talk about Prometheus and performance, it always uh, comes down to cardinality. So what is cardinality actually in this case? Uh, in Prometheus context, uh, the cardinality is the amount of unique time series that you have in your system. And don't forget, like whenever you use a unique label value with your metric name, it creates another time series. So labels are so powerful, uh, but however, you should just uh, be very careful, very considerate when you use them. So. Uh, let's again see an example for this. Again, we are using the same metric. We are at this point very familiar with this one. And we want now, like, we try to uh, track the request total with just adding paths. So we want to track our metrics per path. So it looks good. Now we have some paths and we can get our numbers. However, if we look closely, we also see a lot of random stuff as well. Because like internet is not really a safe place. If you just put something in your label uh, without any uh, like preventive measures, uh, you can end up with like 
uh, really bad situation. If you want to track your discrete events, uh, please uh, try to use a logging system instead of a metric system. All right, another, uh, like another uh, aspect of cardinality is about histograms. We already uh, learned a lot uh, about histograms from Bjorn's talk. Uh, but like, what is actually the problem? Uh, by default, by default, uh, histograms uh, underneath they are just a couple of uh, counters uh, for a counter for each bucket and then some sum and count as well. So if you use just uh, default values for the, your buckets uh, from client go library, you will end up you will start with 12 counters. So if you just put some labels in it, things could uh, get out of control pretty quickly. So again, let's see an example. Now we will, uh, for this uh, example, we will use HTTP request duration seconds metric. And it's like we run our application, we collected a couple of uh, observations, it looks good. But we have a problem actually here because th these are cumulative metrics and like actually our uh, latency is a bit higher, but we have a like lesser bucket boundaries, so these, these are not, not granular enough, so we may not take actions on them. So for that, let's try to add more buckets into the equation. Now we have a more granular picture, now we can actually use them. It's fine, right? Uh, what could go wrong? But probably at a certain point, you will get alert, and it will tell you that your Prometheus has some increased memory consumption. And when you check your metrics, you will see this. Because now, whatever label you got, whatever label you put in there, it is, it's just multiplied by 12. So especially when you are using histograms, please be careful, be so con considerate, and just don't put random values in there. So which actually gets me to my next point, our last pitfall, poorly chosen histogram buckets. So underneath, uh, as Bjorn told us, uh, we have uh, arbitrary, uh, we have buckets. We, why we have buckets? Because we want to use less memory. So by just aggregating all those observations in the client side, uh, we, we actually gain a lot from the memory. So this is, this is what makes uh, Prometheus histograms very powerful. So as a result, you need to uh, be very careful about your accuracy uh, versus your performance. So again, let's see an example. Uh, we will use the same metric, but we will come up with an arbitrary number of buckets. And when we observe, again, these are not balanced, and this won't give us a lot of, uh, th this won't give us any value. So let's fix this uh, by using some convenience method from Prometheus. And now we have better distribution. So. Uh, this coming up with the correct bucket layout is a uh, art form. So for that, you need to know your uh, you need to know your uh, distribution very well, and you always need to keep in mind that like there is a trade-off between accuracy and cardinality uh, when you are choosing your label layouts, uh, bucket layouts, basically. So in summary, uh, whatever you do, observe your uh, applications. Observation is essential, it's not uh, optional. So uh, determine your uh, service level objectives, uh, write your alerts, uh, build your graphs, and use them. And now, since you actually depend on your metrics, uh, you rely on them, and they are now your reliability. Reli so test them uh, as you test your business logic. And uh, last but not least, uh, avoid global state. Uh, make your life easier just for yourself. All the codes that you see, observe uh, this load balancer, it's actually, a, we have a working example and we have more in there. If you want to dig in, if you want to check uh, more, just go in there. And I think that's it from us. Thank you for listening. Also, we are hiring, so thank you. <laughs>